Good afternoon. This is Deborah V. Wilson. It is Saturday, the 6th of January, 2018, and the time is 1600 hours and 53 minutes, and that's GMT minus 6. As you know, I'm looking at security models and how they are experienced by civil society. And, I'm, and I should say civil societies and how those experiences impact the collective national security model for all of us. I've been focusing on three countries and that's Canada, Israel, and the UK. I live in Canada and I spent many, 12 years of, 12 years of activism around issues of national security and before that uh, my activism was focused on women exclusively women and that would be straight women and women who occupy spaces that would be defined as queer what i'm going to talk about today the podcast is i want to focus on an article I saw in the National Post, here in, a newspaper here in Canada. And I'm going to read you a few lines and paragraphs from the article. The article starts with, um, my apologies, the, it was the article was written yesterday, the 5th of January, 2018. Don't step out of line. Confidential report reveals how Chinese officials harass activists in Canada. According to a confidential report submitted to the federal government earlier this year, not yet released to the public, it's just one example of a sweeping intimidation campaign by Chinese officials against activists here in Canada. The product of a coalition led by Amnesty International Canada, the report catalogs harassment ranging from digital disinformation campaigns to direct threats Next paragraph. Targets include Canadian representatives of what the Chinese sometimes call the five poisons. Poison, quote, unquote. The Uyghur Muslim minority, independent minded, minded Tibetans, Taiwanese democracy advocates, and especially the Falun Gong. The group behind the report presented this next. The groups behind the report presented to Global Affairs Canada, RCMP, and CSIS officials at meetings in September. And when uh, September want Canadian authorities to take a more coordinated, aggressive approach to the harassment. So when the article starts out as earlier this year, it's of course referring to 2017. Why this article is interesting to me, uh, given the work I do and my academic studies, it's interesting for two reasons. Number one, here you have a case of civil society communicating with the state their security needs. So you have a bottom up analysis by that included Amnesty International and various marginalized communities in Canada experience of security, the national security model, and what they need from the state. The next reason this article in, is of interest to me is because one of my identities is that I'm a Muslim. And I am a Muslim, was born in the US, and I live in Canada. And globally, in many countries, there's a focus on persons like myself, that would be Muslims moving from one country to the other. Uh, and that is in part because of the construct of the Muslim and the focus around extremism that is emanating from the Muslim, from Muslim communities. That concern has been articulated also here in Canada. But I think what can be a more common and more pervasive security concern for 
a government? Are the security concerns of foreign born persons who now reside in a new country, for example, Canada? So uh, foreign born of persons who immigrate to Canada or seek asylum in Canada. And the reason why, one of the reasons they may have left their country is for political reasons. And the realization that despite the fact that they have physically left their country, they're still tied to their country and that they attract the attention of their country's security model. Through things like social media, the ease of relatively ease of international travel for most people, many people, the world is smaller than it has ever been. The concept of over there really has no resonance these days. When you can go online and see activism in Canada or read Canadian publications pretty much anywhere in the world, as long as the publication's online, as long, if it's on a YouTube video, someone's activism. So what in the past may have taken arduous efforts for foreign, foreign to Canada, intelligence communities to keep abreast of activists that have left the country to call Canada home, might be a click of a YouTube video or reading an article online that came from Canada, but can be accessed all over the world. And so the dynamics and issues that cause the person to immigrate to or flee to Canada are still prevalent. Because of the ease of access of information globally, relatively speaking, and the ease of travel, for many of us, the security issue that the foreign born person that fled to Canada sought to evade is now in Canada. So I actually think that's a more pervasive possibility, that offers a more pervasive possibility for security challenges from asylum seekers and newcomers to Canada. As I said, I wasn't born in Canada. And I have my own personal interest in that I hope this country always stays free and open to those of us who for whatever reason want to relocate. We're law abiding, we follow the rules. I hope Canada always stays open and available to us. But I've also, based on my activism in the UK, I am well aware and have empirical evidence that with the law abiding can and often does include with foreign born nationals that they bring the geopolitics of their home country with them. This article gives voice to that. Again, it's one of the reasons why I find their article is so appealing and I have, I am doing this podcast. Another reason I'm doing this podcast is the, what I see as the reality of the situation from a security perspective here. Canada is accepting a lot of newcomers. Some of those newcomers are asylum seekers, see, uh, fleeing political persecution at home. And some of that political persecution will find its way here to Canada in one form or the other. My opinion, and I'm still learning about the security model here in Canada, but my opinion is that the Canadian security model is going through some changes and will continue to go through some changes 
which in my opinion I think will include some expansion. How I'm defining expansion at this point, that's pretty fluid. Whether it's an increase in numbers, persons, whether it's a change uh, or a nuance in scope, I'm not quite sure. I'm not ready to commit, but I see the model and believe the model is in change. And with that change of expansion, and I'm very quite fluid in how I'm using the word expansion, I anticipate and expect there will be an increase of the ro of a robust oversight committee function. I think it's only reasonable. I certainly don't want a security model that overreaches. That's not productive and that's not actually more security. It's just a security model that overreaches. So that's not practical or functional for anybody. But I do believe that not only this article, but again from empirical evidence I have from the UK, that geopolitics often attach themselves to you. And just because you leave a physical space doesn't mean you leave the geopolitics at home. And because Canada is such a wonderfully multicultural space with a myriad of people who claim birth, a place of birth in a myriad of places, I think it will be, a, it is and will and continue to be an increasing reality for the security services in this nation to have to address persons like these Chinese nationals who are now Canadian citizens, whose geopolitical geopolitics from their place of birth has followed them to Canada and attempting to attach themselves to Canada and what the ramifications are from a human rights perspective and from a security perspective. I'm gonna post the article in the podcast, a link to the article, so you can readily find it. In addition to that, I'm going to post some YouTube videos from CSIS, Canadian Intelligence, and I'll post some additional information on the pieces that make up Canada's security model. And the acronyms would be CSIS, RCMP, CS, CSE, CBSA, and FinTrack, just to give you further clarification. This is Deborah V. Wilson. Thank you for listening to my podcast. Well, the interview itself is unprecedented, but what he said is even more astounding. The head of Canada's Security and Intelligence Service has divulged some shocking information to CBC News, revealing details about foreign government espionage right here on Canadian soil involving Canadian politicians. Richard Fadden made it clear CSIS is now keeping an eye on those politicians. It all came out during the extraordinary access CSIS gave to our former senior correspondent, Brian Stewart. Canada's Security Intelligence Service rarely talks publicly. When it does, people listen. In an exclusive interview with CBC, the CSIS director Richard Fadden exposed foreign penetration right into Canadian politics. We're in fact a bit worried in a couple of uh, provinces that we have an indication that there's some uh, political uh, political figures who have developed quite an attachment to foreign countries. Fadden's most startling revelation, cabinet ministers in two unnamed provinces are under control of foreign governments, what are in espionage circles called agents of influence or secret supporters. So for that matter are several members of BC municipal governments. A number of countries take the view that if they can develop influence with people relatively early in their careers, they'll follow them through. Before you know it, a country is providing them with money, there's some sort of covert guidance. 
at least five countries are surreptitiously recruiting future political prospects in universities. China the most aggressively, but Middle East countries as well. It's not clear how much the government has been told, but leading intelligence experts today were startled by Fadden's timing on the eve of the G20 summit. It is possible CSIS feels compelled by a sense of profound national danger. But very important principles of the rule of law and governance may have been compromised. So in that sense, I think CSIS uh, may feel that it wants to let the public know, and indeed let those individuals and governments know, uh, that they're being scrutinized. It remains to be seen what government will do now to blunt a growing foreign influence it has yet to even acknowledge. This is pretty stunning stuff. Absolutely. The intelligence experts I talked today have never heard anything quite like this come out, and they're, they're, they're absolutely baffled to a certain extent, but think it must be because, again, CSIS is profoundly worried at the amount of infiltration there is in this country. All right. Brian will be back with his second night on CSIS a little later in the program, and then I'll ask Richard Fadden for more details about his candid remarks concerning foreign espionage in Canada. I think most Canadians would be stunned to hear that. What exactly are you suggesting there? I'm suggesting that at least one, possibly a couple of countries, take a very, very long range view of their efforts to influence Canada. You know, the days when you had somebody hiding, you know, in the Chateau Laurier behind a palm tree trying to steal a secret, I think are by and large long gone. You either do it through cyber or you do it this way, which is you find somebody, usually in your diaspora, you know, somebody who has a connection back to the homeland, and you start developing a relationship. Uh, in some cases, this is, this is done in universities through social clubs and whatnot that are financed by embassies. And through time, uh, you, you invite somebody back to the homeland, you pay their trips, uh, and all of a sudden you discover that when an event is occurring that is of particular interest to country X, uh, you call up and you ask the person to take a particular view. Well, you know, I, I understand the problem, but the director of CSIS suggesting that there are politicians in this country, and now public servants as well, you're suggesting, um, without naming them, will raise a few eyebrows. In fact, you know, if I was a provincial cabinet minister, I'd say, hey, who are you talking about? Because you're swiping us all with mm -hmm. this. I think that's fair, and we just don't keep the information to ourselves. In the case of a couple of uh, cabinet ministers, we're in the process of discussing with the center how we're going to uh, inform those provinces. The center being? Uh, sorry, the Privy Council Office, the Prime Minister's Department. Uh, try and get a sense of how we would best let them know that there may be a problem. Uh, we'll do the same with uh, the public servants. We, we, I'm making this comment because I think it's a, it's a real danger that people are to be totally oblivious to this kind of issue. When you say, though, let's take the case of a provincial cabinet minister, that you felt that that person has become too close, mm -hmm. one assumes that you must have been monitoring this person fairly closely. Well, I think that's a fair, fair statement. I mean, under the law, we can monitor anyone. In the case of uh, these individuals, it's developed over the years. They haven't really hidden their association, but what surprised us is that it's been so extensive over the years. And we're now seeing, in a couple of cases, uh, indications that they are, in fact, shifting their public policies as a reflection of that involvement with that particular country. Now, you, you never named any countries here, but you seem to be, it sounds like China. Well, I'm not going to name any, any countries, but as I think I told Brian Stewart, uh, there, there were a few stories in the media a couple of months ago, and uh, I, I wouldn't say that those stories were entirely incorrect. And uh, the country that you've mentioned, I believe, was mentioned in those stories. Well, our full interview with CSIS director Richard Fadden is now on our website. Just go to cbc.ca slash the national. You'll also find Brian Stewart's exclusive look inside CSIS. And check out our blog called Working in Shadows. You'll get a sense of the restrictions the spy agency placed on our team while shooting this story.
of the meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start by introducing my two colleagues. On my left, I have Mr. Andy Ellis, who's the Assistant Director of Policy. And on my right, uh, John Dunn, who is the Services Director General of Communications. I appreciate this opportunity to appear before the committee with a view to clarifying a number of issues that have arisen as a result of remarks I made during the CBC special on CSIS. I would propose to take a few minutes available to me to comment on the following. One, CSIS's decision to be more open to the public. Two, the nature and scope of foreign interference in Canada. Three, an explanation of how I came to mention the possibility of two specific foreign interference cases and four, the extent to which anyone outside the service was aware of foreign interference in general and the two cases specifically. Let me start with why I believe Canadians should be more informed about the threats Canada faces. While the CSIS Act has set up a comprehensive package of accountability, oversight and control over CSIS involving the Minister, the Federal Court, the Security and Intelligence Review Committee and the Inspector General, its activities and especially the threats it must deal with are relatively little known or to the extent they are known, these threats and activities arise in the context of specific cases or inquiries where it is often difficult for the service to set out its perspective as the principal Canadian agency designated to protect the national security. With the exception of the horrific case of the Air India attack, a few other terrorist attacks and some instances that were successfully prevented, for example, the Toronto 18, we have not seen much terrorism on Canadian soil. And we do not, as a country, often reflect on threats relative to espionage, terrorism, and foreign interference. I would argue it is good public policy for Canadians to be more attuned to the threats that the country faces. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I would like to take a moment and explain to the committee how the most controversial part of the recent interview came to be in the public domain. I am referring to the cases of foreign interference. I made these remarks during a question and answer session following a speech I gave at the Royal Canadian Military Institute on Police Appreciation Night. This took place on March 24th of this year as part of an agreement between the service and the broadcaster to develop a special broadcast commemorating the 25th anniversary of the service. We agreed they could film my visit to the RCMI. I thought the filming was limited to my speech and so in answering a question I provided a degree of granularity or detail to an audience of police, intelligence and military experts that I would not have provided to the public. Confronted by the broadcaster in late June with the substance of the remarks recorded three months earlier, I felt I had little choice but to address them in a forthright manner. I agree that this was not the optimal way in which to have this matter raised in public and wish that it had turned out differently. Let me, Mr. Chair, make two points. My comments did not in any way endanger national security and it was entirely by inattention on my part that uh, the re details were made public. I do not agree with all the criticism of these remarks, but I regret any distress I might have caused and would not provide such detail again. Having said this, I stand by my general message on foreign interference. It is a concern and a threat. I, it is more common here and elsewhere than many think, and it is desirable that this threat should be known and discussed. And indeed, as I will reference again later, this matter is not new and has been raised in many of our recent public reports available to all Canadians. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the examples I gave did not and do not today meet the criteria for us to consider them to constitute threats to the security of Canada. As such, they had not and have not been briefed to the Minister of Public Safety, although he is generally aware of foreign interference in Canada. The same applies to the Privy Council Office question was the issue of foreign interference, let me take a few minutes to discuss its nature, scope and extent. Parliament clearly recognized the existence of this problem at the time the CSIS Act was passed in 1984. The CSIS has a clear mandate to investigate foreign interference as a potential threat to the security of Canada. I say potential because unlike cases of terrorism or espionage where the threat to national security is more immediate and where the ramifications can be extremely serious, for example loss of life or loss of serious national secrets, Foreign interference operates on a range of seriousness, and it is only the most serious cases which constitute clear threats to national security. I'll provide some examples in a couple of minutes. First, what is foreign interference? Simply put, it is an attempt by agents of a foreign state to influence the opinion, views, and decisions of Canadians with the aim to obtaining a political, policy, or economic advantage. The CSIS Act talks about the threat of foreign-influenced activities as, quote, activities within or relating to Canada that are detrimental to the interest of Canada 
and are clandestine or deceptive or involve a threat to any person. This is, of course, a broad definition that could involve many facets of behavior, but it's important to note that for behavior to be considered as true foreign influence, it must be directed against the interests of Canada and must be deceptive in nature. It is important also to signal that it is also important to note that unlike terrorism or espionage that can result in more immediate damage to our national security, foreign influence is really more of a process of relationship building. This is not a simple binary black and white issue. We are dealing here with a spectrum of behavior by foreign entities that often start out innocently but later veer towards something that actually harms Canadian interests. This is a very subtle process. Central to our concerns with true foreign interference is the strong belief that decisions about Canada must be made by Canadians for Canadian reasons. And that means by those whose loyalty is to Canada, whether they have been here for generations or have just received their citizenship last week. ...are sometimes caught in this process of foreign interference unwittingly, and we assume from the outset that citizens are loyal. Our central concern is with what foreign powers are trying to do in Canada and why. Our service also understands that most Canadians have links with homelands, whether real or in recent or remnants of our past, and we, as we are a country, a remarkably diverse country. This is normal for a country that plays such a large role in the world and whose citizens come literally from everywhere. For our purposes today, I limit my remarks to foreign interference in the Canadian political process. A couple of explanatory points, Mr. Chairman. Unlike terrorism or espionage, there is not always a breach of the law. Like ter terrorism or espionage, however, at least some of the influence is covert or secretive. Unless the Canadian being influenced commits a specific, specific violation of Canadian law, the issue of concerns to Canada, to CSIS rather, is Canada's democratic process being affected secretly and by a foreign state. CSIS's objective is threefold, to identify the foreign agent and to cause the influence to be stopped, to identify the person being influenced with a view to making the appropriate authorities aware, and three, to generally protect Canadians from this sort of pressure. And five, the persons being influenced are often Canadians with whom the foreign agent can relatively easily develop a relationship. Having set up the essential characteristics of foreign interference, let me try and illustrate the range of seriousness I mentioned earlier. Regular and overt diplomatic contacts typical in the business of international affairs do not constitute concern unless they become part of a longer term plan or spectrum of behavior that is detrimental to the interests of Canada. Let me skip through a range of intermediate examples and set out one at the other end of the spectrum. Thus a case which would be of interest to CSIS would involve an agent of a foreign power providing a Canadian over months or years with various benefits which become increasingly significant yet less and less open over time. This relationship includes an extensive exchange of views, opinions and information slanted toward what the foreign state is interested in. At some point, consciously or not, the Canadian's views are changed and he or she begins to push or advance them as his or her own, thus potentially affecting decisions with which he or she is involved. A very important point is that foreign interference is intrinsically objectionable to Canada whether or not it succeeds in, obtaining, in attaining the objective of the foreign state because such activity becomes detrimental to the interests of Canada. In summary, I should like to leave you with the following points. National security is not always directly or immediately involved in cases of foreign interference. But where the possibility exists that there is harm to national security, and we have reason to suspect this is true, we must investigate. Two, CSIS's mandate is to protect Canadians and our democratic process from covert and deceptive influence. Three, the Canadians identified to be influenced can be anyone with the potential to affect decisions in a manner favorable to the foreign state which emerged during the CBC special, I'd like to make three additional points. There was and is no immediate threat to the national security, so we are taking the time to complete our analysis before reporting to government. Two, given this, there was and is no need to brief the minister until such time as CSIS has completed its analysis and discussed them interdepartmentally. And three, only when these consultations are complete will the service brief the Minister of Public Security and make recommendations on how to proceed. Since the various media reports went to air, one aspect of the discussion of foreign interference that has surprised many in the security and intelligence community has been the general shock at the existence and extent of foreign interference in Canada and elsewhere. I would not wish to belabor the point, but as I indicated earlier, CSIS has been informing successive governments of the threat since its creation. 
Its last five annual reports have referred to it in Parliament as annually granted funds for us to investigate foreign interference. It is a threat that is not unique to Canada. Our close allies are also targeted. And it is probably worth noting that our two review bodies have over the years regularly looked at and commented on our foreign interference investigation in the same manner that they review, for example, our terrorism case. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by summarizing a few of the points I've tried to make this morning. One, we do believe there is merit in Canadians being more informed about the threats to our national security. Two, foreign interference as set out in the CSIS Act is a threat in Canada and a threat which I believe Canadians, of which Canadians should be aware. Three, CSIS's principal interest in foreign interference is protecting Canadians in Canada against the efforts of foreign powers. Four, anyone can be the subject of foreign influence, and often initially they are unwillingly or unwittingly so. Five, foreign influence is not always a direct or obvious threat to national security, but rather a process that, over time, can convertly influence our democratic processes. Six, in respect of the two examples I gave, neither my minister nor the Privy Council Office was briefed on the cases, although they, are although they are generally aware of the threat of foreign interference. Mr. Chairman, I hope these remarks have been helpful. They have been drawn together on the basis of public and parliamentary comment, but I should be pleased to try and answer questions on any other manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fadden.